okay. read more, become a, uh, a better student of history, mm. understand more about your place in this, uh, in this nation, in this world. Uh, I would t also tell young Mark to pay better attention in high school and take advantage of the opportunities to learn in high school. It'll better prepare you for college. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. There will still be the journey. The journey. New Sheriff in town, and the name is the journey. Journey. This thing is bigger than Nino Brown. This is the journey. The journey. What is it that moved you? The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey initiative is generously supported by Nike's Black Community Commitment. Welcome back to another episode of The Journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson, and today we have a Memphis icon. Hasn't always been a Memphis icon, but he's definitely one now. But before we get to our Memphis icon, first let me give you a quote. The quote comes from the great journalist, Susan Taylor from Essence fame. Whatever we believe about ourselves and our ability comes true for us. So what is it saying? It's basically saying that what you believe, so as a man thinketh, what you believe is going to come true. Whether you're right or wrong, it's going to come true. So believe in yourself. Trust yourself. Be your own advocate. And today we got a brother that's straight out of St. Louis that literally is just that. He believes in himself. He's committed to growth. He's committed to the Memphis community. He's a lifelong journalist. His first job out of college was at the Wall Street Journal. This brother started in high cotton. <laughs> great friend, great son, husband, and father. We're speaking of none other than Brother Mark Russell. Thanks, How you man. doing, brother? Good to see you, man. Good, Good see seeing you. you as well. Absolutely. Man, I'm so gr grateful that you're here. Absolutely grateful. Um, I'm happy to be here. <clears throat> so we're going to start with the early years. Let's take it all the way back earliest memories of home what you got so my home st louis north okay. st louis to be precise okay grew up in a working class neighborhood okay father worked at post office mother was a secretary sort of later in her career with the public schools in st louis mm -hmm. we grew up in a two-family flat in a neighborhood that was probably not un dissimilar to many neighborhoods in south and north memphis okay hard-working people who uh, knew to do the right thing, but they were we were surrounded by people who were sometimes bad influences. Uh -huh. And so I had to be someone who really looked out for myself with guidance from my parents, who were my first true role models, mm -hmm. to kind of figure out the right path. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always easy. Didn't have a lot of good influences outside of my household about the path to take. Mm -hmm. I didn't really believe in myself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in the face of people who were doubting me within Well, hold the on, don't go, don't go too far. Don't yeah. go too far. We're going to do that in a second sure, half. Sure, We're sure. going to expand it all. Yeah. So what I'd like to know is I noticed you mentioned, you know, that you kind of had to lead the way. Yeah. Who was somebody, just somebody, that outside of your parents that were had a big influence on young Mark Russell? So I'll give you one example. It was a guy when I was in high school, I think I was a junior in high school, it was a reporter who later went on to be an editor at different papers named George Curry. Okay. He edited the, the George Curry. The George Curry. Oh, edited wow. Edited Emerge Magazine. Yeah. He was a White House correspondent, but at right. that time in St. Louis, he worked for the Post-Dispatch mm -hmm. as a, uh, just a general assignment reporter. Okay. And I met George through my mother. My mother okay. said, you need to meet this guy, George Curry. I think she really worried that I was going down a path <laughs> that would lead nowhere. <laughs> Right. And she wanted me to meet someone that she admired and thought this might be a career for my son who uh, likes to talk a lot, uh -huh. very personable, but doesn't really have a, a lot of purpose to what he's doing. Right. So I met George, and George was a whirlwind in my life. Okay. He was a great role model, gave me sort of a pathway, an example of something I could do in my life. Hmm. Hmm. What decision did you make as a young person that ended up having really a lifelong impact even though you didn't have any idea it was going to have such an impact when you made it? It's a great question. I think one of the things I did early on was to choose not to follow the, the crowd. Mm. That I chose to do the things that I knew would make me a better person and a better student, okay. a better, a better uh, son and a better brother okay. to my family. Right. So I would very early on 
not choose to do things that might put me at, har at harm's way, at risk. Mm -hmm. So I was never really involved in things that might get me in trouble with the law. I was, in, I was I'm sometimes called a square. Mm -hmm. I was sometimes called bookworm. I was, I was fine with that. You was cool with it. I, I knew I had a larger purpose in life, and okay. I didn't need to succumb to peer pressure to do things that I knew might get me in trouble. How different are you from the person you dreamed you would be as a kid? Oh, I never had a dream. I would be a journalist okay. or an editor of a newspaper. Okay. I, I'm not going to kid you. When I was growing up, I would have been happy to have just been a reporter. I would have okay. been happy to just work at a bank. Okay. I would have been happy to do any, be a teacher. I was fine with all those things. Uh -huh. So my, uh, my career horizon started to enlarge once I got in college. Okay. And once I started to see what was a possibility and start to meet people, I said, I can do this. Okay. But again, even then, I didn't know I could become an editor. Okay. That came over time. Okay. Okay. So, did, as a kid, did you ever dream football player, basketball yeah. player? I had all those dreams. I dreamed of being a football player, basketball player. I didn't have the athletic skills to do either one. <laughs> but I had, I had those, those dreams. I also wanted to be a banker. Oh, and really? Didn't really have the math skills. Didn't uh -huh. really have the, the uh, Why a skill banker? set to be a banker. What sort of money was. Okay. And I thought, I want to be reason. somebody in charge of the money. Uh -huh. I want to be somebody who was a money manager. I just thought that was an, an important aspirational goal to have as a young person. Mm -hmm. But again, once I beca became older in high school and went to college, I thought, okay, here's something that's very attainable. Right. Something I, I like doing. And again, I had that role model in George Curry who was really pushing me toward that area. Right. And I was growing up in St. Louis. University of Missouri is right down the road. Right. Great journalism school nearby. Right, right. Hmm. So that really fell in place. When did you know? At what point in your life did you were you able to look in the mirror and say, I'm going to be okay. I got this. Probably when I was a 25, 26-year-old reporter, sort of still finding my way in the business, I had left the Wall Street, took my first job at the Wall Street Journal right out of college. Mm -hmm. And looking back, I wasn't ready for that. Right. I wasn't ready for a job like that. I didn't know enough to be ready for a job like that. Really? But it was a great place to cut my teeth and to right. grow and learn and to make mistakes and grow and learn, albeit on a very large, large stage with a big spotlight on me, which again, mm -hmm. that was probably a mistake to go somewhere like that right out of college. Right. But I learned a lot. I think by the time I was 25 or 26, I started to have a real sense, I can, I can do this and I can really excel at this. Mm -hmm. not, not only because I thought I was good at it and was still growing at doing it, mm -hmm. but also because I was getting, I was having impact. I was having uh, the ability to talk to people and meet people that I never would have thought I'd have to be spending time with ministers. And I was working in Cleveland, Ohio back then. Right, right, right. Cleveland, Ohio ministers, met uh, Otis Moss, the uh, junior, mm -hmm. for the first time, famous minister confidant of Dr. King. Right. Uh, it was very much a, a world that opened up to me when I was 25 or 26 in, in uh, Cleveland, working as a business reporter at one point, mm -hmm. but I started as a city hall reporter. You ever have any desire to be an entrepreneur? No. No whatsoever? Always, always wanted to be a journalist. No. Wow. Always wanted to be a journalist. Tell the stories of other people. Okay. Okay. What's your why? Why do you get up every day and fight the good fight? I get up every day and fight the good fight because I want to see what we do, inform and entertain people, help them understand the world around them. Right. That's my why. I want to help people through what we do with the commercial pill, wherever I've worked, understand better the world around them. Okay. And I think there's great power in that. Right. So every brother has this defining moment in their life. I'd like to know, when was the first time you realized you were black? Oh, hold yeah. On, hold on, there, hold on. That's many times, yeah. Listen, yeah. we're going to come right back on the journey. My brother Mark Russell is going to tell us when he realized he was a brother man. Listen, stay right there. Coming right back. This is the journey on the Kazookia Network. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. Success in life is not a straight line. There are twists and turns in everyone's life, and the more you know about their story, the more you'll understand the process. Kazookian Media Group proudly presents The Journey, a show that features successful black men in Memphis telling their stories of their lives and the ups and downs they've encountered on their ultimate road to success. We believe The Journey will encourage young men and help them see that life is a journey. 
Watch The Journey, hosted by me, Larry Robinson. Brought to you by the Kazuki Media Group in partnership with the Delta Boule. Welcome back. I told you we was going to have another excellent, excellent Memphis icon to come talk to us today. So before we left, we were talking with Mark about when he realized he was a black man. But before he goes there, I want him to share with us, who are you? What if, if you had to tell a group of people who you were? How would you define yourself? I would define myself as a father, first and foremost, a husband, someone who uh, loves his family and loves this community, mm -hmm. and also someone who wants to see this community get better. And okay. through our work at the Commercial Appeal, particularly from a professional standpoint, I want to make sure we do stories and do journalism that helps this community see itself and helps this community be better, be a better version of itself. Okay, okay. What's your superpower? I think my superpower is my ability to listen to people and really determine how I can help them, uh, whether it's through working with sources, working with reporters, with my family as mm -hmm. well, my neighbors and my friends. Mm -hmm. My superpower is really being able to listen to people and kind of really divine what it is I can help them do, help them uh, get something accomplished. When did you realize that that was a superpower of yours, that you were an excellent listener? Uh, when I became an editor. <laughs> because, I, you know, people often presume that an editor's uh, highest and best use is editing. Okay. And in fact, I don't subscribe that. I think it's really more about being a good listener and helping tap into what makes someone better. Right. Whether it's a reporter you work with, other editors, people in the community you're working with and talking to. Yeah. You have to be a good listener. You have to be able to figure out how it is you can help people. Right. That's right. your really that's your divine superpower to me as an editor is helping people do things, helping people get better. Fantastic. Um, so we ask about when was the first time you realized you were black? Unpack so that. There are probably many other points on the journey where I also realized I was black. Uh -huh. But I started off by telling you I grew up in North St. Louis, in right. a black area, um, working class community, very solid area. Right. When I got to, to high school, at Rosary High School, mm -hmm. this memory is uh, kind of seared in my memory. and. It was a time when one of the teachers, I think it was an English teacher, mm -hmm. questioned a paper I produced and whether I really wrote it. Mm. I may have been a sophomore in high school, and his, uh, his response to me was that this is so insightful, mm. uh, did you really write it? And I thought, well, why is this teacher asking me this question? Because I want to be a writer. Right. <laughs> I wrote this paper, but there's an assumption that I didn't write it, and it's, it can only be because I'm black. Right. Only because I'm black. I think there were maybe about four or five other African Americans in that senior class at Rosary High School that right. year. And I, I just couldn't imagine that comment being made to one of my white uh, classmates. How did, how did your parents, did they, were they aware of this oh, yeah. situation? I brought it up to them. Okay. Yeah. How, did, how did they respond? Uh, they told me to persevere through it and that, you know, clearly I had written a paper and I was able to persuade the teacher and others that no, if you look at my past papers, you'll see this is a consistent theme of mine to write this way. Right. And maybe this is a little bit better in your eyes because you're looking at it more closely. Right. But this is something I've always been doing. And they backed off pretty quickly, but my parents both were very adamant in telling me, no, you need to persevere. Because, you know, as a young person, I thought, I can't go back to the school. Right. I don't want to go back to the school. No, 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 you have to go back to the school. Right. This is a challenge, and you'll face many challenges in your life. This is just one of many you're going to face. Tell me about your dad. My father was a, uh, a post office uh, supervisor okay. late in his career, had been a post worker early in his career, mm -hmm. very uh, strict, stern, led by example, uh, loved his family, mm -hmm. uh, loved his community, and really always had time for me as a, uh, as a young, uh, as, as a boy and as a young man. Mm -hmm. Got great advice from him. He was uh, a man of few words, but led by example always. Okay. Tell me about the day that day, that one day that you wish you could, that you wish you could erase from your memory. Um, that, that day that we day typically say is the, was the worst day of our life. Huh. It's a good question. Uh, well, I mean, un, 
undoubtedly one of the worst days of my life was when I got fired from my uh, job as editor at Orlando Sentinel. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'd been editor for about uh, three years, about three, close to three years. And I got fired from that job. Uh, they, they called it something different. Right. right. They called it, uh, you know, we're moving on, eliminate the position, reorganization. Right. Oh, no, I, I just got fired. <laughs> and it was a real, uh, it was a down day. Right. But it's also a day I realized that, you know, I'm, I'm bigger than one organization, mm-hmm. that my, my uh, uh, set of uh, ethics, that my set of, my skill set, mm-hmm. and that my uh, complete professional image is not contained and not, and not um, defined by one organization. Mm. And it took me a while to process and work through that, but that was clearly my worst day. Because really? I felt like a, it was a professional failing on my part, mm-hmm. but it wasn't a uh, failing that defined me. Were you, were you married at the time? I was, yeah. How did your wife respond? She was very supportive. She was very supportive. And, and I think she realized early on that I would need a great deal of support. I kind of early on thought, I'll be able to come back from this. I'll find something else. You, you, you kind of know that instinctively, but you don't see it happening right away. Mm-hmm. And so you think, right, okay, right. I'm in this period now where I'm unemployed. Right. I'm a former editor. I'm not editor anymore. I've lost sort of my, uh, my uh, prestige as an editor. Right. But I had great friends around, that surrounded me, both in the business and outside the business, who kept mm-hmm. supporting me throughout that period. And they really helped me get through along with my family as well. Wow. And this is Orlando. This is Orlando. What was the next stop? Memphis. Oh. So, so I, came from, <laughs> I came from Orlando to Memphis 2013. Okay. So I got fired literally in, in uh, late August and had a new job a few weeks later in Memphis and started here oh, September wow. 30th. So it didn't take a lot. Of, it seemed no like worries. it took longer. Yeah. But it took absolutely no time. Oh, it was a vacation. You know what? It was uh, it was stress filled. <laughs> I bet it was. I bet it was. It was stress filled. But what's your what's your fondest memory of your school age time? You know, being in school, and it can be college yeah, or high yeah. school. I think my college years were uh, fantastic. And, okay. And, and there are a lot of things I could talk about, both my journalism school experience, right, the social experiences I had. I'm gonna talk about my fraternal experience. I pledged okay. Alpha Phi Alpha. I'm my, sorry. I, I'm really sorry to hear about <laughs> <that>. my sophomore <laughs> year. And that was a defining period for me because I was able to meet other brothers who were similarly right. situated in terms of their academic pursuits and wanting to become part of fraternity, something bigger. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of sacrifice involved, as you right. well know, yeah. yourself being part of a fraternity. Right. And I think that was really, for me, a defining moment and helpful for me in seeing who I was and able to build some bonds that still exist to this day. Wow. Now, you talk about brothers. I want to, and you mentioned a brother at home. Yep. Tell me about that dude. Yeah, so my, my brother, Robert, Robert Russell, okay. is about um, six years older than me. Okay. Also an Alpha Phi Alpha. Okay. And he also is a, um, uh, someone who, unlike me, he didn't go into a creative writing field. He's mm-hmm. a contractor. Mm. You know, I, and I'm the exact opposite. I can't build anything when it comes <laughs> to tools. And he's, he can build anything. Okay. You know, from a family room on our, our former home in St. Louis to uh, whatever you want to think of, patios, whatnot. He's, he's very good at building things. Uh-huh. He's worked for a long time in that business. And he's been, he's been an example for me just on how he deals with uh, his, his own family. Right. And how he also deals with uh, career issues that he's faced. And he and my sister have both been tremendous uh, role models for me and people I've turned to and talked to when I've had questions about where I wanna, what I want to do next or how I should do things. Now, well, how was the family constructed in, in St. Louis? So it's my mother, mother mm-hmm. and father. Okay. I have an older sister who's, six, who's now seven years older. I'm 60, she's 67, my brother's okay. 66. Okay. And they both now live in St. Louis. Okay. But they've lived all over. Right. But they've moved back to St. Louis. Brothers live in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He's lived in Brooklyn, New York. My sisters lived out on the West Coast in California. Now they're both back in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. So we all grew up together, but they were older than me. So by the time I got to high school, they were already out the nest. So you were a baby? Yeah, pretty much. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was, almost, it was almost like I was the only child once I got to high school. Oh, man, man. So um, what did the city of St. Louis, what did you take from the city of St. Louis that you brought with you to Memphis? Uh, a little bit of a swagger. <laughs> uh, I think people who were born and raised in St. Louis, particularly North St. Louis, have a, a little bit of a swagger to them. Okay, you know, okay. Much like sometimes 
people in Memphis that meet have the same kind of swagger. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's the same in Detroit and Cleveland and Chicago. Uh, you don't feel as though there's anything you're going to see in another city that's going to present a challenge you haven't already faced in your hometown of St. Louis. Right. And you kind of know from whence you came. So if you've already succeeded having grown up in St. Louis, you don't see any challenges insurmountable wherever you are. Right. Because you've already surmounted some challenges getting out of St. Louis. Right. And doing what you're doing. What has Memphis meant for you and, and what has Memphis given you? So Memphis has given me a, a lot. Uh, I think first and foremost, Memphis has given me a really interesting canvas to work in. Okay. It's a historic place, a place that's very proud of its history and, it's, and, and deals with the challenges head on. I think that's an important distinction about Memphis. Mm -hmm. It also is a place that is of extreme hospitality. It's mm -hmm. easy to meet people, mm -hmm. easy to get to know people in Memphis. Having lived in Boston and then Orlando after that, right. in Cleveland, I don't take that lightly. <laughs> but it's easy to meet people in Memphis, easy to get to That's know true. people. And I, I found it to be a great place to kind of raise my family, mm -hmm. get to know people. Uh, folks accept you. Right. You know, that there's no uh, waiting period. There's no uh, trial period to get right. to know you. That yeah, it's, it's true. It's immediate. True. It's immediate here. Right, right. So your career, I would imagine you went from Wall Street Journal at some point in Orlando and now to Memphis. Yep. What were some of those stops in between? How many jobs in journalism have you actually had? Uh, many. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, if I had to list them all out, I'd probably be up about seven or eight jobs, separate jobs. But okay. I'll just talk about the cities I've worked in. Right. So I've worked in Cleveland, okay. Ohio, with the Wall Street with the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. I left Cleveland to go to Pittsburgh. Okay. I went back to Cleveland to join the Plain Dealer, which is the daily newspaper in, in Cleveland, Ohio. Right. As a uh, business reporter. Okay. Then I became a city hall reporter. Mm. Then I became an editor in Cleveland. Moved from Cleveland to Boston, where I was an editor for about two and a half years and moved from Boston back to Cleveland. You're starting right. to see a little bit of a trend where I kept going back to Cleveland. Right. I became business editor in Cleveland, okay. moved on from business editor to become sort of the metro city editor for the Plain Dealer, which is, at the time, I thought this is my dream job. This is a fantastic job. I'm never going to do anything else. Uh -huh. Then left Cleveland to move to Orlando as managing editor. Okay. Uh, moved to Florida. You right. Know, big change for me, big change for my family. I'd never, oh, yeah. never lived in Florida before. Uh -huh. uh, a new person going to a new market in a new city. Okay. You know, great challenge, but I, I enjoyed, enjoyed it. Had a great time. Mm -hmm. Stayed nine years until I got fired. Right. Then I moved to uh, Memphis okay. about uh, 10 years ago. Mm. Yeah. And Man. became managing editor first. Right. Had a couple of jobs in between there, but generally managing editor, some, der some, der some derivation of that. And I also was... Uh, uh, opinion editor for about uh, six months before I became uh, the interim editor and then the then the editor six years ago here. Now, you said earlier that you never dreamed of you being an executive editor. When did that dream become true and did you have to punch, pinch yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Not punch yourself, yeah, but pinch so yourself. When I was in Orlando, I was the managing editor, which is one step removed from editor. So I always right. knew that was a strong possibility. But again, you until it happens, it, you don't really fully right. embrace that that it's going to happen until it actually happens. And so I was the uh, managing editor in Orlando for about, um, I guess it would have been six years or so. Okay. And the editor left, and I was made the uh, acting executive editor. And I okay. kind of knew early on as an acting executive editor, this job sort of fit me and that I, that I sort of embraced it mm -hmm. in the newsroom equally important embrace me. Mm -hmm. I was always a person who wanted to be involved in the community. I thought that was a good fit for that job. Mm -hmm. And I think that pretty early on, I had a sense that, okay, I can do this and this will happen. And when it finally happened, I remember going home to my wife that night and say, it's finally, it's finally happening. It's mm -hmm. finally happened. And wow. it, was, it was a huge uh, relief to get the job, but also a huge responsibility. Well, I know it's challenging being an outsider sometimes in Memphis because of the familial relationships that a lot of Memphians have. How have you navigated that? Okay. I would say that's a familiar thing in many cities, not just Memphis. Okay. It's perhaps more pronounced in Memphis because it is a majority black community and mm -hmm. I'm an African-American who is editing a paper that has a history 
I'm not always being friendly to African Americans. So mm. I think if, at first when I became editor, there were some people who viewed me as, okay, let's see what this new editor can do and let's see how he approaches the community. Right. And one of the ways that I tried to both diffuse that issue and also make connections was to get out and meet people on their own turf. Okay. And again, be a good listener and to try and understand what we as a newsroom could do to better uh, serve the community. So one of the things we did early on was we um, we hired a columnist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know Tanya Weathersby, who, right. who now has left to go to somewhere else, but right. Tanya stayed with us for about five years. Uh -huh. And I think that was a huge step for us as a newsroom to have a another African-American columnist. We'd had Wendy Thomas before that. Right, right. Who was also very, very good and, and was had a very big impact in this community. Right. And we went and got Tanya Weathersby to come in and do the same not the same thing, but a similar kind of job right. and bring our own flavor to the job. That was important. I think the other thing was that we, early on, try to do stories throughout this community to reflect the entire community. And even go some areas like Frazier and Whitehaven where maybe we didn't go previously right. mm -hmm. and then do stories uh, in a way that show the full spectrum of this community. So I think that was important to show as well. Okay. So I'm going to take you back. But I'm going to take you back as Mark Russell today. You walk in the door of your old house. Mm -hmm. You see young Mark sitting there watching cartoons. <laughs> what would you say to young Mark as Mark Russell today? Yeah, I, I would uh, say quit watching those damn cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I didn't really watch a lot of cartoons growing okay. up, but if I saw a young Mark Russell watching cartoon or watching, I pretend to watch sports all the time. Okay. I would tell that Mark Russell to read more. Okay. Read more, become a, uh, a better student of history, mm. understand more about your place in this, uh, in this nation, in this world. Uh, I would t also tell young Mark to pay better attention in high school and take advantage of the opportunities to learn in high school. It'll Ooh. better prepare you for college. Okay. Better prepare okay. you for college. Well, Mark, we coming to the end of this, and I know that you got something to leave these young people that are watching this, listening to you right now. I'd like you to look in that camera right there and leave them with a Russellism. Uh, my Russellism is that you have to understand that this, this life journey is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And keep that in mind always whenever you're doing something wherever you're trying to grow, whatever you're trying to do to improve, that it's not a, a simple sprint to the finish, it's a marathon. And life's journey will sometimes take you down some unfamiliar paths, you will, you will scuff your knees, you will make mistakes, but you get up, you keep moving, you keep learning, and remember that's a marathon and you will do fine. Wow. Whatever we believe about ourselves and our ability comes true for us. That's all he's saying literally stay on the course know that it's a marathon and keep believing in yourself and you can be anything you want to be listen this is larry robinson for the journey i want to thank our guest thank brother you, mark russell appreciate, it. appreciate you my man and listen keep coming back i told you we're gonna keep bringing them to you i just need you to keep showing up listen this is the journey on the kazookian network and i'm your host larry robinson Till the next time. Thank you to our partners at Nike's Black Community Commitment. To hear more incredible stories like this, be sure to download the Kazookian app from the App Store or Google Play. Or check out the Journey Memphis podcast on all your major podcast providers. Also, check us out on the Kazookian Network. <laughs>